Hey folks, welcome back to the Dark Horse Podcast live stream 126 Q and A. Here we go. Uh, we got two questions from the Discord this week, uh, which were a tie the last time they sent them in. And since we have not been doing Q&As, I'm just going to read them both. All right. One, I'm an independent researcher. So this, the Discord is, you can access the Discord uh, if you join either of our Patreons. I'm an independent researcher outside of academia, and I'm having an extremely hard time finding studies for a topic where most of the papers are critical theory and social justice. I'm looking for medical insight, not opinions on society. How could non-academics weed through thousands of studies and begin verifying what is trustworthy? Are you snickering over there? <laughs> um, I don't know that academics have a, any of a better time here, but uh, I'm, academics have access, uh, depending on where you are, to a library that may not erect firewalls as well, to, you know, paywalls, firewalls, paywalls to block you, but it's not like the research is even any better behind the paywall. Yeah, that's really the question yeah. is, um, you know, we're being washed over by a tsunami of garbage and I don't know of a single discipline that has escaped it. Even things where this should be completely irrelevant, like uh, math and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and cosmology are suffering from it. And so anyway, I, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know when we're going to revolt on the basis that we have to have a functional system because we are all dependent on it. It is our life support system. We are, we are on a spaceship and the life support system has been, um, over, uh, it has been hijacked by numbskulls and, yeah, I mean, I think um, back 10, 15 years ago, when Brett and I were very, very well aware of um, many of the ways in which higher ed was broken and peer review was broken and science was broken and, you know, and the granting agencies that were dictating what kind of science was done and what kinds of results were reported was broken and the private-public partnerships was inherently evidence of brokenness and all of this. Um, but still, still have managed to be surprised by some of what has happened <laughs> of late. Um, <clears throat> still, back back in those days, when part of what I understood my job to be was um, teaching students how to review the literature, how to review the scientific literature, how to access it, how to the cats are brawling on the floor behind <laughs> me here, um, how to access the scientific literature, how to interpret it, how to indeed um, do what you say. You know, these were undergraduate students who had access to. Um, a fairly low quality academic library, but I would encourage them to go up to UW's library and, and such. Um, but the question, how can non-academics or new academics or really anyone weed through thousands of studies and begin verifying what is trustworthy? That long preamble was by way of saying, um, even with what I understood to be the problems with the system then, um, I'm not sure that the following advice I think the following advice is getting ever less relevant, unfortunately. Um, but one of the things that I would say to students was um, you, you you learn how to skim first and you try to figure out, and it's going to be very different uh, depending on the particular questions you're interested in looking at in the fields, um, try to find the one or two or you know, wouldn't it be wondrous if it were 10 uh, people who are doing work in that field uh, that you think are doing really excellent work? You know, how is it that you're assessing that? Um, that's to some degree a related question, but also a whole other, other question. Um, once you find such a person, uh, you look at what papers they cite and you look at, um, you know, who, who cites them and you start tracing, you start tracing basically through references cited lists as opposed to trying to do um, start from scratch searches uh, in, you know, in Web of Science or Google Scholar, or, you know, whatever your, whatever your access point is. And uh, it's not perfect because it would be great for us to be able to do completely novel from scratch searches whenever we are trying to figure out whenever we walk into some new topic uh, but you quickly find that uh, be if you are interested in questions across a wide number of domains as we are as many people are uh, that you that it's helpful to have a way in and sometimes that way in is 
I'm going to feel completely out of my depth for a while until I find the two, three, four people who seem to be doing reliably um, high quality work. And then I will use them as my jumping off point for, you know, looking at who they cite and, and such. Um, uh, that's harder and harder now because even the questions are being curtailed by, um, by the granting agencies, even more than they were be, being 10 and 20 years ago. Yeah, I have very little to add because it feels like the system is obviously so deeply into collapse and effective suicide mm -hmm. that it's a little bit like asking, you know, okay, well, the Titanic is going down, but which decks are best? So, uh, you know, they're all not best. Yeah. I mean, I... <laughs> Another thing, when you know, back when we were professors, and I was asked to do actual peer review uh, for some number of papers, uh, at some point the the request sort of stopped. Um, I think because I almost almost always, unfortunately, one of the main things that I came back with was, "Where's the hypothesis? I don't see any evidence that this is um, uh, hypothetical deductive work." In which case, it may be interesting, but it's not science it's an observation that pretends to be science because it used some fancy stats in the middle and um, the fact that so many of the papers that i was sent for for peer review um, had no obvious hypothesis was suggestive of uh, you know a, a deep rot in scientific publishing um, so any paper that at least <laughs> any paper that doesn't have an obvious hypothesis is one that you should have read with suspicion from the beginning and if it does if it if it leads with a hypothesis uh read on and and see what you see um so my my rule is every paper should either lead to a hypothesis or proceed from one and so you know it doesn't necessarily have to start with a hypothesis but if it doesn't it's observational and then should lead to one but the problem is even those that seem to proceed from one um may not have right the of course rewards to pretending that you predicted something and then uh you know rearranging the chronology in the paper in other words if you if you do an observational study and you don't have a hypothesis and then you see some pattern in your data and you pretend you predicted it and then you say the paper you know reveals this thing then you violated the um you violated the underlying philosophy of science and it doesn't mean anything it's worse than a paper with no relationship to hypothesis it's a fiction and we have no mechanism for knowing you know other than knowing that the person who did it or the people who did it have integrity mm -hmm. which is an outsider you're unlikely to be able to assess it, it's uh you know it is a rewarded kind of anti-scientific behavior yeah so the second question from the discord server this week is do you two ever lurk on discord um i have never been on discord i have been on discord i will say i find discord so off-putting in its structure that the uh the architecture is not intuitive and so anyway, to the extent that I have thought, oh, I'll just go on Discord and figure it out, the fact that it's not the kind of environment that you can just explore and understand causes me not to invest, even if I know that people that I would be interested in interacting with are there. Hopefully, in the near term, we will have a replacement for that community, which will not have those defects and will not have the onerous terms of service that people who are on the Discord fear might be wielded against them. Yeah. So we love the fact that there is a vibrant community, a vibrant dark horse community. Can you see what's going on over there? Yeah, for a fact, um, I'm around the um, <coughs> Excuse me. We love that there's a vibrant uh, community there. And um, both of us have interest in participating. And as Brett has alluded to just now, and as I have on, on previous live streams, we are hoping to have something um, that is at less risk of censorship and um, it has different origins uh, soon. Soon. I thought there was another Discord question here, but I'm not finding it at the moment. So we will, we will get there if we get there. All right. First question from the Q&A site this week. Reading is effectively a form of learned audiovisual synesthesia. 
We see symbols, then experience a sort of mild hallucination conveying meaning and experience. Music too, though an intrinsic emotional auditory sort. Dance is emotio kinesthetic, art generally, and so on. How should we view synesthesia through the evolutionary lens? Do we miss an opportunity to, li to deliberately construct and train more forms beyond reading? Is language only in its infancy? <clears throat> is language only in its infancy? Also, totally separate question. Any plans for a live traveling lecture series? Let's save that one for afterwards. Um, I love these questions about synesthesia. I would love for us to uh, be able to spend time thinking about this in more depth on air at some point. I don't know that this is quite the moment. I will say that I explored it some in a piece that I wrote called Memories of a Mugging, with which, which raised questions of, from an experience I actually had, of which senses come online and which disappear at a moment of acute uh, physical stress. And it prompted me to think a lot about indeed what it is that we are perhaps uh, curtailing in ourselves and and how we are limiting ourselves by both the categories by which we define the the senses and the boundaries that we lay around them I feel like as I as I think I say in that piece which I don't actually know if it's even available anywhere now it, it must I must have made it available somewhere um, it children seem to be synesthetes Right? Like children, and, and to what degree is that informed by the environment that we hand them? You know, those, those, those like blocks, those like carpet, those interlocking carpet blocks that have the, the letters in them that a lot of modern kids end up having. If A is always yellow and B is always blue, and I'm making up those numbers, but um, perhaps you end up, you end up with children as they're developing understanding that a language even exists, that a written language even exists, uh, assuming that if A is yellow on the floor when you fall on it, then A is always yellow, and, and therefore you have a sense of, of letters, for instance, coming in particular colors. Uh, so that, you know, to some degree, synesthesia is likely to be generalizing from early experience. And, you know, when you have some experience of, you know, a visual sort that has come along with a sound and you may overgeneralize and assume that those are, those are linked in a way that they're not. But in general, I do think that synesthetes are displaying, as you suggest in this question, uh, a, a more fluid and creative approach to the boundaries that are often useful and often real, but breaking down those boundaries can sometimes reveal other truths that may be hidden by them. Um, so first of all, I think we know that that thing is true about uh, children's toys and numbers that people who experience mathematics uh, with partic particular uh, color and shape reference, it turns out that uh, this connection exists. I will say, I think this all goes back to the question of why we have subjective experience in the first place. Um, and th this is not obvious because our experience or because our conscious minds spend so much time engaged in uh, subjective experience. In fact, that is effectively what they are. It seems like the way you would go about virtually anything. And that's sort of a failure to empathize with creatures that have no reason for a subjective experience. So, you know, we anthropomorphize them and, and to our detriment. But the point is, you live in a color by numbers subjective experience realm, right? You're Basically, stuff is categorized, you know, wavelengths are categorized by some subjective experience, which we call blue, you know, yellow, red, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And the point is, you, your schema is not written in stone, and it narrows, it becomes more and more efficient over time. In other words, so early on, you may use an inefficient scheme. And then your scheme gets better and better and therefore less and less interesting and less and less flexible. And mm -hmm. then, of course, you can push those boundaries uh, with entheogens or something like that. But but in effect, what you're, the point is, yes, children are more imaginative, right, and less reliable. And this is an extension of that principle that uh, the schema that they use is more variable and less useful. And then as we become adults, it gets 
more useful and less variable. And in some ways, that's too bad. But uh, but the whole thing is colored by numbers in the first place, and that's that's the important thing to remember: is um, you are an isolated critter in a world that does not make visual sense. You make visual sense of it, and uh, that is not a straightforward process. So it's, it's got tons of assumptions built into it. I also am going to recommend a novel uh, that was published in 2006 by a man named Jeffrey Moore called The Memory Artists, which is about uh, hypermnesia and synesthesia. And uh, I haven't reread it since then, but uh, when I did read it in 2007, I found it extraordinary and got me thinking a lot about synesthesia then before I ever had uh, the mugging that prompted my further thinking about it with regard to neurology and such. Now I have to find the questions again. Here we go. Oh, uh, any plans for a live traveling lecture series? Yeah, uh, we, we have thought about this and uh, we would have loved to have done a book tour that was live. And in fact, we were talking to someone who was awesome about doing it and then you know, COVID kept making it very, very hard. So uh, we don't have anything formally planned, but it is, uh, it is definitely a possibility. Early this January, when our school told my unvaxxed boys to stay home because of a COVID close contact, while vaxxed kids could continue to attend, I decided to pull them out. I've been homeschooling since then. What do you predict for the fall? Home study has been incredible, but my nine-year-old misses his friends. Uh, right. I think there's two questions in terms of what to predict for the fall. There's what actually happens with COVID, and I would expect bad stuff to return and then there's what the political structure wishes to do with that it may wish to ignore it in which case it might be that this disappears into the noise of other winter illnesses or it could be that it wishes to utilize it in which case it could be a more tyranny and it's very hard to predict because we don't know what it's trying to accomplish and whether or not it's decided to switch topics and use something else as an excuse for tyranny. Um, but uh, I, I, I have serious concerns about, about what takes place uh, in the fall. And uh, I, would not, I would not count on the fact that the worst is behind us. It may be, or it may be that the topic switches and, you know, what we are nominally driving each other crazy over is about something different, but the effect is the same. Yeah, with regard to the particular benefits of school versus homeschool, uh, I think especially given what many of the things that we know to be going on in many schools at this point, uh, if you are the kind of person who can write this question, you are almost certainly going to deliver a better education to your, to your uh, daughter. Son, I don't remember. Son, I uh, um, but uh, exactly as you say, it's the it's the social part of it that's so valuable that you can't replicate, right? Uh, the children children should have others. Um, yeah, you know, it's also totally artificial that we put them all in a room with only their same age. That's very artificial. But children should be with other children and learning from them, and not just learning from their mother or their father or uh, you know a few adults. And so that that is. Um, the extraordinary benefit of school that, of course, all that Zoom schooling pretended didn't exist, um, which was ridiculous. Uh, and that is the, the, the very big loss uh, that um, the children being homeschooled alone rather than in, say, a community, you know, a small community of, of parents who are homeschooling. I, I think that's probably the biggest negative. Uh, and, there, and there aren't that many. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, I think partially the problem is that those of us who did not, um, those of us parents who did not buy the party line sufficient that we found ourselves at odds with their schools are sufficiently outnumbered that the obvious thing doesn't happen. I mean, I, I don't know why we're sending our kids to school in the first place. It's like we send them to a place where they are actively being miseducated. <laughs> what exactly is our rationale for doing this? Okay, it's because they need the social stuff. But on the other hand, 
what is the social stuff? Well, they are learning to sit masked with other people who don't call out obvious bullshit. And, you know, at what point do you say, well, I don't know which tragedy of history we're living in, but it's obviously one of them. And one's first obligation in such a thing is to protect their children and protect them from what? Well, I don't know what all they need to be protected from, but I do know that that's part of it. And maybe they should be gathering, you know, all of the all of the people whose parents recognize that school is now an actively negative anti-educational place that instills conformity and fear. All mm -hmm. of those people should probably be gathering their children and making some effort at uh, formally educating them, but largely just giving them normal social inputs and uh, insulation from mental garbage, hmm. right? That would be cool. So I don't understand why there's not a widespread outbreak of this. I don't understand why we're all on autopilot with respect to, um, yes, it's terrible that postmodernism has taken over college, but I'm still sending my kid there. Like, okay, I understand that we don't know what we're supposed to do instead, but Again, we are, all of us, including us, are actively sending our children to places that we know are hurting them. And I, I'm amazed that we haven't opted for absolutely anything as an alternative to that. Right? It's, right. it's autopilot. I mean, we, do, we do have at least a, uh, at least a temporary alternative for, for one of our boys coming up. Yep. Yep. And maybe, it's, maybe that or something like it becomes the replacement for, in that case, college. Yep. yep. Next question. Hey, are you aware of the Younger Dryas impact theory? And if so, do you have thoughts on how this would affect our social evolution if there were advanced civilizations before then? Do you know of Randall Carlson's work? I don't know the name Randall Carlson. I do know ish about the Younger Dryas impact theory and, um, and thought that and did a just super like 30 second um, Google Scholar search on um, most of the paleoanthropologists and and other people who think about such things find um, the evidence non-existent for for this. This is like so. The idea is something I don't even remember. Uh, like ten to thirteen thousand years ago or something, um, it was proposed back in the mid aughts that there was an uh, an impact, uh, extraterrestrial impact that wiped a bunch of stuff out, including evidence of previous advanced civilizations. I, I think I may be combining two aspects of this, um, but you know, later analysis is like, yeah, all of the evidence presented is either misunderstood or maybe even fabricated in some cases and um, really doesn't add up to uh, a hypothesis that makes much sense. That is my very, very scant understanding. Yeah, I know even less about it. I think it seems pretty unlikely. Yeah. You know, things like a sea level change can swamp civilizations that were uh, that were existing. And you yeah. know, in one fell swoop, you can uh, erase an awful lot of stuff. But hard to imagine that, that such a thing was in play here yeah on that time scale yeah, yeah. i mean that that's it you know as 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 dawkins has famously said failure of imagination is not an argument but there would there would be evidence across so many domains that we don't seem to have yeah uh, that is uh that is basically the the likely answer there next question our shrew-like ancestor most likely had claws fit for climbing trees, and we have fingernails. Is there a cool story to go with that transition? Where might fingernails be headed? Um, so, I mean, that we do we do have. It's it's not at primates. It's actually at the at simians. And so simians being monkeys and apes. Um, the the so-called pro symbians symbians. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. So called pro symbians, which isn't really a word that's used anymore, but like the lemurs and the tarsiers and the Galagos and Galagos, lorises babies. Um, have um, have nails still have have uh, rather have claws, <clears throat> and it's actually a a simian synapomorphy, a, a shared derived characteristic of both the new and the old world monkeys uh, that we end up with these flattened nails uh, that are less good at you know claws help you stick to trees as you're climbing, uh, and nails. Uh, provide better access to the pads and therefore probably greater dexterity. Now, all primates, including those the so-called prosimians, the lemurs and lorises and everything, have the opposable thumbs and, and big toes, uh, but those would have been less useful with claws. 
And so the nails are uh, almost certainly at least, at least they help with, and they may well have evolved for uh, greater dexterity in grabbing and manipulating objects with those opposable thumbs and big toes that already predated the nails. I have always wondered and have never looked into it whether or not there's anything about the idea that the nails are uh, on the back side of these pads, which are innervated. And of course, mm -hmm. innervated certain, meaning neurological, like sensory yeah, nervous system. High, yeah. highly, uh, highly sensory. Uh, um, I'm going to struggle for half an hour finding a synonym <laughs> for innervated. But, um, but anyway, the point is maybe the idea is if you need feedback, neurological feedback from the things on your fingertips that actually a a black a black a, a blank even uh, yeah. slate effectively mm -hmm. um might be the perfect background for it yeah now i don't know i don't know that that's true and there's obviously bone between the the pad of the finger and the fingernail so yeah but but just a not. but just a rod of bone it doesn't extend you know it's not flattened it's not it's not dorsolaterally flattened i don't think yeah um and, you know, the, what are the nails doing for us? You know, I guess, I mean, they protect the top of the fingers, but, you know, they, you know, the keratinized tips, as I call it, when I clip off the keratinized tips of our, of our carnivorous friends so that they don't wake us in the night by scratching at us. Um, those pre-exist, and so they're already there. And so it, you know, it, it may be that there's not that much benefit in having the nails but it's better to have nails than claws and maybe they start to disappear right and in fact you can see that very pattern in pinnipeds so pinnipeds which are bears that have become seals <laughs> um <laughs> you're gonna get like half a second of hate mail before right the, before you it. <laughs> right uh, pinnipeds are what now pinnipeds are bears that have become seals and sea lions and if you look at their flippers what you actually see is that their nails have moved back onto the middle of the flipper right is that right yeah i've never gotten that close to it's, a pinnipet it's I think. pretty pretty wild actually um so they're so, still there they've right. just receded and so i'm sort so of the wondering flesh, the fleshy part is is all you see at the very tip yeah yeah so if you yeah actually that's uh, they still have all of them is i'm it? trying to remember there's a difference between seals and sea lions in this regard and i'm trying to remember exactly what it is but one of them has ears um you could actually you, i don't know if you can do it without the external pinnae is one of them right um but anyway anyway the point is maybe the importance of seals versus sea lions in terms of the nails now we'll see if that brings anything yeah. out if you just said we'll see seal and sea lion uh claws you get images but um okay. yes front feet um noisy earless Doo -doo -doo. can you just google sea lion flipper and seal flipper and then look at the images uh, but anyway my argument was going to be maybe the evolution has built a reluctance to lose claws mm. uh, because any ancestor that had lost claws would have a huge disadvantage. And so at the point that bears become aquatic and they are seals and sea lions, that they these would be moved out of the way. Now, of course, I also do think that there's a certain amount of scratching that they actually still do with them. They're not They vestigial. totally do, yeah. Um, uh, so I don't... The seal, they kind of, at least at the moment, it's looking the same, oh, similar to me. Yeah. So this is just, you can, I guess, show this yeah. one file, this one picture, Zach. Um, sea lion, but, you know, can I don't, I have him? no idea if this is legitimate. This is just off flicker. Um, this is claimed to be a sea lion flipper, and you can see the claws, exactly as you say, sort of, you know, back offset by a couple inches. Yeah. Uh, beyond the terminal edges of the flipper. Yeah shouldn't be flicker it should be flipper but I, 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 last time i was on flicker and it's been a while they had more than just um pinniped flippers on it mm, yeah so that mostly, may be the reason uh, for it being called woodpeckers <laughs> all right the biology jokes are going to come to a halt here because we're going to drive off what remains of our audience if we don't <laughs> cut that out okay um well where is my what what happened to the questions what happened 
They've all been answered, darling. No, they just, they, okay. Um, yes, or anything else? Where might fingernails be headed? They might be disappearing. I wonder. Um, I mean, certainly, like, what's what's the toenail on the baby toe doing? Uh, just threatening to get ingrown at any moment. It's It seems, I mean, they all kind of seem useless. I mean, I guess with your hands, you can see, like, it might be protective when you're doing certain things. Um, but with regard to the toes, it seems not that useful. I mean, if you drop something on your toe, it hurts regardless. Mm -hmm. I don't think the nail really helps that much. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I would miss them if they were gone, the toenails, but... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It is, it is a bit mysterious. Yeah. Is the fundamental assumption underlying game theory, when instantly did it transition from being game hypothesis to game theory, <laughs> that, that's in the question. All right. That, that I can answer. <clears throat> that the context of the games of game theory is zero sum, positive sum, or negative sum. Uh, as far as you're concerned in biology and the evolution of life, as far as you are concerned, is biology and the evolution of life a positive sum game? What about physics? That's um, like, that's three questions. Well, I think. Physics can take a long walk on a short pier. Okay, that was the fourth question. Oh, well, I just thought, thought I'd start at the end. And sure, no, absolutely. Backwards. Okay. Well, um, what did it transition from being game hypothesis to game theory? You really have an answer to this? I do, kind okay. of. <laughs> but no, I think, I think it's important because, you know, I am, of course, constantly running a program that checks whether or not people are using these things, including me. I screw it up every now and again, but checks to see whether you're using it correctly. And the point is, it's not wrong to say, you know, we're looking for a theory of everything. We are looking for a theory of everything, right? The point is theory is what you get when it works. Hypothesis is what you have before you know whether it has worked, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, string theory ain't nothing. It doesn't predict a damn thing. So the point is it's not a theory or a hypothesis. It's, it's a notion or a, an intuition or something, um, you know, or it's math, but it's not a scientific theory. So anyway, my point is why is the realm called game theory because it wouldn't make any sense to call it game hypothesis the point is it is a search for a th the theory of games oh it's like evolutionary theory right okay so this is actually it's not game theory isn't just one isn't just one hypothesis right and um i'm a theorist. yeah it's a lens game theory is a lens it's a lens i'm a theorist what I come up with are hypotheses, mm -hmm. and if I do it well, they become theories. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'm a theorist because the whole point of the exercise, yeah. even if I don't control that last step, yeah. is um, is the generation of theory. Yeah. So the answer, <clears throat> you didn't answer when did it transition from game hypothesis to game theory. You said, actually, no, this, the umbrella term should be game theory, just as the umbrella term should be evolutionary theorist, not evolutionary hypothesis. Hypothesis, correct, mm -hmm. correct. Okay. Um, is the fundamental assumption underlying game theory that the context of the games of game theory is zero sum, positive sum, or negative sum? Yes. Like, that, is that a complete solution set? Well, except that the person is actually, and then when they say, what about physics, they kind of deliver the, uh, the punchline, which is, yeah, everything is zero sum, negative sum, or positive sum until you get to the ultimate, at which point it's zero sum. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. And so anyway, yeah, I think that is the, the underlying assumption. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a complete solution set. Yeah, so, especially yeah. if especially if you in, include that last dimension in which you're, you know, at any given level, you may have positive zero or negative sum. But there's a recognition that, you know, there's a limited amount of stuff in the universe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once you turn it all into paper clips, it's mission accomplished. Mm, awesome. So the final question in this multi-part question then is, as far as you're concerned, is biology and the evolution of life a positive sum game? Um, <sighs> yes, it is in the following sense. We often play a zero-sum game because we don't know how to get to the next frontier. What frontiers do is they introduce positive sum, and the point is it is always limited, right? It cannot help but be limited, which is why- Every frontier is finite. Right, they're oh. all inherently finite. Jesus, um, that was shocking. <laughs> but this is why the last chapter of our book argues that the fourth frontier, which we effectively say is a perpetual 
thing is an architected steady state, right? The point is you there is no infinite frontier, but you could make something that felt like one, mm -hmm. right? Just the mm -hmm. same way it always feels like spring inside your house. Yeah. Um, you can architect a steady state that feels like growth and is therefore, it's like, you know, is a treadmill an infinitely long sidewalk? No, but it might as well be, right? <laughs> yep. Man, we got, we got cat madness here today. Yep. They want to go outside. As do I. Yeah. All right. Uh, I also, I, Zach, I forgot to check out when we started, just so I can keep an eye on the oh, time. So was it like uh, it was like two fifty four or something? Okay. Loved Brett's conversation with Jonathan Pajot. Maybe you can talk with John Vervaki. Vervaki. Mm. Seems like your perspectives would bridge in a significant way. Yeah. So we had the three of us talked uh, a while back now, and it's great. And I yep. think I think. I think that may be in the works. Well, we were actually on the calendar, and I can't remember what got in the way. Yeah, um, but it's not for lack of interest right. on either of your interest, parts, I, I don't think. think. Yes, we all agree that that would be a good conversation and uh, that there is an awful lot of overlap in thinking. And I, I have the sense that uh, John Verveke is um, a separate evolution of many similar ideas that cover uh, similar phenomena. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's always useful. Yeah. Um, useful and interesting and uh, a little bit fraught because, as I always point out, anytime you generate your own framework for thinking about something, you inevitably redefine terms because the terms that you're handed aren't aren't uh, sufficiently refined to do the heavy lifting. And then right. So some of the some... conversation has to be about just establishing the dictionary. Right. Which mm -hmm. is not easy because, you know, right. it, it, uh, we all forget what terms we use in some special way. And uh, so anyway, my, my sense is that unfortunately, and I think this is a little bit what happened with Jonathan Pajot as well, is there's no fast forwarding that process. Yeah. It's not like you can say, let's spend the first 15 minutes defining our glossaries and then we'll yeah. get to the substance. Yeah. It's a couple of weeks of learning how yeah, somebody yeah, thinks yeah. before yeah. you realize, ah, this is where I need to stand in order that yeah. they don't keep tripping me and, up. And the categories won't be, the boundaries around the, for God's sake, Fairfax is demonstrating his deep disrespect for the primary literature. He's chewing on a uh, peer-reviewed paper that you've got printed out here. And having pulled that away from him, he's decided to move on to some Velcro that, I don't. I don't disagree with his conclusion. It's just very distracting. It's very, very distracting. Yeah. Well, he's he's the next producer. Mm. Um. There will also be. So it's it's always, it is exactly as you say. Very interesting to discover. Oh, you've arrived at some place very similar through a totally different. Uh, totally different domain, totally different discipline in, you know, maybe autodidact, maybe an established discipline that didn't even we didn't even know we were doing the same thing. Not only it's it would be one thing if it's like oh you call it X I call it Y cool perfect match, uh, but it's rarely going to be a perfect match. Uh, and uh, you know put aside like the territoriality over like you know what my word's better because I've been using it for longer. Um, more to the point, there will be nuance uh, nuanced differences between the two versions. And uh, to some degree, you know, there'll be a Venn diagram and, you know, the more overlap, the more likely you can be like, okay, when you say X, I mean Y. But uh, very often, um, simply because of the different approach that uh, the two fields, the two people took, the terms may be a very close match, but not a perfect match. And figuring out exactly the nature of the mismatch is part of the process Yep, as well. I always go into it uh, with the agreement that it, I don't care whether the terms we walk out with are my terms or your terms, it'll be a mixture, but we need a term for everything that needs a term and we need to have agreement on what terms mean which thing. You mm -hmm. can't keep sp speaking your own language. If you're gonna overlap with somebody, you have to figure out what language is your, you know, your lingua franca and it needs a term for everything and the terms need to be sufficiently precise that you can say things and know exactly what is meant by them. Um, yep. Which, you know, it's a lot of work, but it's also very rewarding work when you find somebody you can talk to who, you know, is interested enough in the same things to have terms Indeed. for them. Indeed. 
Should we be concerned about cumulative radiation exposure from yearly mammograms, dental x-rays, etc.? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. Yeah. I mean, it's not the biggest thing that we should be concerned about. Well, <laughs> but that's pretty low bar. So let's talk about... Um, it's going to be mimesis, right? Um, there are two separate things that in most people's minds are not distinct, which we have to separate. One of them are radioactive particles, and the other is radiation. And radioactive particles emit radiation. We need to be really, really concerned about radioactive particles, and we don't need to be that concerned about radiation. There are levels of radiation that are sufficient to be concerning, by and large, because of the awareness of the danger of radiation, things like dental x-rays have been reduced in their intensity a great deal. Basically, we've gotten really efficient, and we can use a small number of x-rays to get a high-resolution image. These things get worse when we do fancy new fangled stuff like, you know, that rotating x-ray that goes around your whole head and takes really many, many, many x-rays and then compiles them into a three-dimensional model. That's obviously a lot of x-rays compared to a static shot and you need to be more you know concerned about something like that. You're talking that. about that thing in the airport or uh, also an MRI. Yeah um, yeah I don't, I don't go through the thing in the airport that's for sure. Yeah. Um, it's not to say that I you know I did once I was late enough for a plane that I did go through it. It's not like I think it's likely to be fatal to you in a small number of interactions but I was traveling enough and I just don't think it's worth it. You mm -hmm. can be at the airport long enough that the pat down doesn't keep you from getting on your plane. Yeah. Um, but anyway the point is I, I worry much more than most about radioactive particles. It's really bad to ingest those things. It's really bad whether you breathe them in or eat in them. It doesn't matter. It's really dangerous. Um, and they, you know, we know actually a fair amount of what happens with radioactive isotopes like cesium and strontium. Uh, uh, cesium, which I believe goes to muscle, strontium, which goes to bone. These are mm -hmm. really big dangers with respect to cancers. But radiation, we are built. We, we, we did not evolve with lots of uh, radioactive cesium or strontium, uh, much less uh, uranium and plutonium. The reason being these things aren't stable. And so to the extent that they were created at some point in the past, they've disappeared. Mm -hmm. We now recreate them and ingesting them is bad because you don't have a good system for dealing with them. On the other hand, radiation that just simply threatens your DNA, threatens to disrupt it in ways that when it is repaired may not spell the same thing and therefore could in theory be cancerous. We've got lots of protections <clears throat> from that happening, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, telomeres is one good example. It's a failsafe where if you get a mutation that starts a tumor, it doesn't end up being a tumor. It ends up being a prototumor and you never know you have it or you do know you have a mole and you don't know that it's anything beyond that. So anyway... Worry less about radiation and more about radioactive particles. Mm -hmm. That's my advice. Good. Nice. Uh, next question. I wish I had in the can a good answer to this. Um, <clears throat> but I have a place to go where you might quickly be able to find, if not this, lots of other good things that are kind of related. You indicated that avocado oil is healthier than that of seed oils. Can you please elaborate on this? Um, there is, at this point, a ton of research uh, that suggests that uh, the increase in seed oil consumption in basically post-industrial uh, revolution America is one of the things that can be most easily pointed to as contributing to many of our very bad health outcomes. I do not have the answer in the can about um, you know, what, what all we think is happening there. Um, and... What I will point to instead, since I'm, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to try to riff here because I don't remember at the moment, uh, is I will point to this extraordinary substack, uh, Slow Down Farmstead, you can put on my screen if you like, um, Zach. Uh, Slow Down Farmstead, written by my friend Tara, uh, who um, I assume she's written about seed oils and their their health effects at some point here, um, but she's written about um, you know nutrient density density dense foods and fasting and various ways to be nourished 
and just so much, you know, how food on the go that allows the people whom she loves to stay, you know, deeply and deliciously nourished rather than having to grab something out of anything fast. And so I'm sure somewhere in here there's this analysis. And uh, I know many people have talked about it, but I'm going to do you the service of pointing you to Slow Down Farmstead. Uh, Can I ask you a basic question yeah. that you probably do know the answer to? Okay, I hope so. I, I, I have known a lot of these things, and I've just, at the moment, I've been thinking about sunlight instead. Yes. Avocado oh. oil. Yeah. Is it from the avocado meat, or is it yeah. from the avocado seed? Yeah, so and I think the very first time this came up on Dark Horse, um, I hadn't thought about avocado oil actually explicitly. I thought about seed oils and such, but I sort of thought avocado oil might be from the seed, and someone, I don't remember who, I apologize, corrected me and said, no, avocado oil's not a seed oil. It's not coming from the seed. Interesting. Yeah. So, so canola, safflower, sunflower, grapeseed, also known as rapeseed, um, all of those are seed oils. Okay. What about palm oil? That's going to be a seed oil at the at the biological, morphological level. How is it from the point of view of health? I, I think not good, but I don't. Not good. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we have olive oil and avocado oil. And both coconut oil. Uh, right, which is a seed, but it's but a coconut. Coconut is such a different kind of beast. Yeah, it'd be uh, interesting to know why coconut oil is different. But I agree, that's my instinct. Yeah. But but with it, with respect at least to I mean, olives, we can, we, this is this is not proof of anything. But uh, it being solid at room temperature um, is pointing to it's being a little bit more like animal fat. Animal fat. Yeah. Right now, and again, boy, like there's so many people amazing people who really know this stuff and I, th I think in this regard we really do have a fairly depth deep understanding like we being the bigger science community and we don't necessarily we just right. we know what we avoid and we know what we what we cook with and what we don't but but it's interesting yeah. that olive and avocado are exceptional fruits in the sense that the reward is not sugar it's fat yes yes quite so the reward for the for the distributor of the seed yeah um, so anyway, I wonder if that's not. And maybe, I mean, actually, on. maybe with coconut, uh, it's going to be something similar. Where um, you know, coconut, I guess. Oh, wait a second. Because the seat is the. I got it. Yeah. Um, the, the seed is the fruit. The seed is the fruit, and the yeah. distributor of coconuts is oceans. Yeah. And the point is, the thing that makes the, basically. You know, if you've got a bird and both avocado and olive are going to be bird distributed fruits. Yeah, the, the, the origin, original avocado is being somewhat smaller than these. This <laughs> ones you get in the markets now. No, like, you know, like orange sized avocados is probably not at any, anything like what uh, yeah. well, we wild know, type avocados are. We know from South America um, that the forest avocados, which are eaten by the spectacled bears, yes. are little things. Yes, exactly. So the, the spectacled <clears throat> bears come down out of the paramo for the summers when the avocados are fruiting, and we've never seen them. But this is this is what we've been told by people who apparently know these things. Yeah. Now, I am not going to argue that those bears are birds, but I am going to argue that avocados <laughs> elsewhere are distributed by birds, which I'm almost sure of. But um, anyway, I I could see um, arboreal mammals going after avocados. Oh, I could see a lot of things yeah. eating them. The question is, what is the plant? What, what is do? the what is the plant hoping for? Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, if you imagine birds are long distance distributors, are very good ones actually. Yeah. Um, and oceans are too. And coconut. The the weird thing here is that coconuts basically grow near the ocean, and they have these basically boats attached to them, these big woody um, fibrous things, and they float tens hundreds sometimes thousands of miles they're on the canoe <laughs> yeah. um and then of course you will often find them sprouting on the beach somewhere else who knows where they fell in the water but i have this picture um that i took on nosy mangabee this little tiny island off the coast of madagascar uh which was intact forest uh and you know there's a coconut growing and it's just like it, it clearly it rolled up on the beach and then there was low tide for long enough that it it started to grow and like oh this is the only coconut tree on the entire island, and here it is. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, gamble on a hypothesis here. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about fats, the reason that animals store energy 
in fat is that animals move and fat is light and therefore cheap to transport, mm -hmm. right? Plants don't tend to store uh, energy in fat because they don't have to move it around. In their seeds, they do store it as fat, which is why we can get it from grape seeds or whatever, because the point mm -hmm. is, again, at the point you've got a seed that you want... Grape, grape seed is not grapes. It's not grapes. No, it's, no. I mean, it's, also, it's also called rape seed. I don't know if it, G got added because it reminded people... I don't know the history. Well, nonetheless, there's, anyway. a, there's a lot yeah. of fat in seeds because there's a premium on getting a lot of energy in that package because yeah. that package is again on the move right yeah. so the sessile plant may not have a lot of fat in it the seed will tend to have fat in it and for a disperser who is going to travel a long distance there is again a priority on high density high energy density mm -hmm. of which fat is good yeah um, high energy density per unit of weight because basically it's cheaper for an animal who's eaten it to fly having eaten it. Um, so the question is, is the thing that's keeping the, um, the avocado uh, or keeping the um, coconut afloat mm -hmm. and providing it a whole bunch of energy with it's which It's a combination to... of the fat and the air. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And... So anyway, avocado, olive, and coconut may all have reasons to have made fats that are not, um, well, you would sort of expect, I'm going to talk myself in circles here, but, um, but that there might be something about the uh, long distance dispersal and the nature of the fats utilized, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, unites these three things. Anyway, um, yeah. please, in your hate mail, um, <laughs> Point us to any relevant literature yeah, and seriously. logic that would be necessary to unpack the puzzle. Yeah, no, I'd like to. Um, my guess is Tara may have written about it, in which case I really will recommend whatever she's written about it. But um, I'll bet there's a good, simple explanation for at least some of what we've just been talking about out there. Uh, what, what would it look like if an enemy wanted America to defeat itself from within? Mm. Yes, uh, somebody should put together a sci-fi documentary in which they describe the present in excruciating detail, and that would be how the enemy defeats us from within. Yeah, having gotten a substantial proportion of the population to deny the most obvious and simple biological realities. Necessary to reproduce. And to, to fight to fight those things tooth and nail. And to even I've even seen in the wake of the Alito leak earlier this week, some some news organizations doubling down on talking about pregnant people. Yeah, like, um, not not going to remain intact as a society that way, are we? No, no, um, no, right. we're not. No, you could do a lot of things. You could feminize the military. That would be cool. Mm, that would that um, would work. Yeah. You could also um, you could cause everybody who wasn't of the dominant phenotype to suspect everybody who was of the dominant phenotype of some uncurable moral defect that would make them mm -hmm. unpartnerable you could challenge you could provoke the anger of uh, against the people who are doing the hard work of trying to maintain law and order and maintain that they are all bastards oh yeah you could you could cause the law and order people to resent enforcing the law yeah mm -hmm, that's good mm -hmm, yep. you could attack the concept of merit sure um, you sure could sure claim that that was actually uh a trick of the dominant uh phenotype mm -hmm. and you could inform very small children that they're not what they think they are and uh, if they are they're wrong and if they're not well then we'll help them transform themselves into what they think they are oh yeah you could inform them of that at school and then you could uh, tell them to be very, very quiet and not tell their parents. Don't tell their parents. Mm -mm. Yeah, you nope. could do that. You could. That would help undermine any sense of, of family and sort of uh, sort of social integrity. Right. Uh, yeah, family, yeah. again, a, a trick of It's the hard to imagine how any of this would work, phenotype. but like you right. could do but any of these in things. In theory, yeah. you know, we're plausibility, yeah. not a limit. Sure, you could sure. do all these things. Yeah. You could uh, print a fuck ton of money and... Uh, <laughs> Right. Yep, yep. Yeah, because yep. that it, we could you do know, that. That would make some sense. Um, you could like just actually disappear the words and uh, and and language of anyone who didn't go along with what you were saying. 
Oh yeah, you could you could, could accuse them of special. You could accuse them of being the con artists. Yeah. Some of this is not about uh, an enemy wanted America to defeat itself from within. Although you know, frankly, I would say that any enemy, anyone who is acting in any of these ways, whether or not they think they're acting patriotically or not, they're not. Yeah. They're not. They are the enemy. They yeah. are the enemy. Oh, you could um, you could upend the established detente over the most divisive issues the country has ever navigated after printing the fuck ton of money. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, that would that would also that be, would also be effective. That would be useful. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you, could, you could dehumanize anyone uh, with whom your team finds any reason to disagree and sort of um, you know, separate them out into their constituent parts and then make fun of those parts and then argue that if you do that ever, you are yourself the enemy and the problem. Ooh, yeah, that's good. Um, you could, uh, yeah, you could come up with something onerous and needlessly dangerous you could mandate it for everybody in every industry mm -hmm. and then you take whoever is like wait no i don't want that thing mm -hmm. and you fire them all but i mean you could even you could even have produced the thing for which that onerous and dangerous treatment was produced in the first place on the basis by claiming that you're doing it only in order to preserve the health of the people then you've now produced the thing that's actually making the problems mm, mm -hmm. yeah well yeah. okay here's some ideas were you to want to destroy society from within you could mm -hmm. take any one of these and then just i mean you wouldn't want to do them all at once because right. it'd be too much i mean it would who, be too much. you couldn't get the entire population to go along yeah, with it could you go along with it no you're gonna attack merit <laughs> come on you're gonna demonize the majority yeah. population and claim that they have a, a, a moral disorder that uh, makes them unpartnerable i mean nobody's yeah. gonna buy this shit no you're gonna claim like turtles or slide rules and men are women that's not that's not how it is <laughs> okay where were we <laughs> <laughs> well, we were tearing our, ourselves apart from within yeah i guess yeah. okay well there's oh, oh okay we only have a few more minutes <clears throat> happy mother's day dr hying much love to you and yours thank you that's tomorrow hmm, correct um as a gay man i'm still dying to hear brett's gay hypothesis when will we hear it by it's not bi, it's gay. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to keep going because I know you're not going to reveal it right now. No. Soon, um, I hope. No. Okay. Soon. You, 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 you get the society wrangled so that we can actually put something on the calendar, rent a hall, and not uh, be told, oh, I'm sorry, you have to refund everybody's ticket money because it's the new disease du jour and the mm -hmm. mandates are X, Y, and Z. And yeah. then we'll do it. Uh, regarding masks outdoors, some people are just uninformed, but in winter, I find it keeps my face warm, like a scarf, and in spring, I could see it helping with pollen allergies. Thoughts? This is interesting. There was a, there was a day, I think, I think I only remember this one day, but last winter, uh, when I, when I went out, and of course I had a mask with me, because you had to, uh, but I had a scarf, because I, I do love scarves, and a hat, and it was dry when I went out, but cold, and it just started blowing blowing and raining and i did put on the the mask because it did actually keep my face warm and i'd never love it i don't like breathing in air that i've just breathed out i don't i don't like how it feels but um i don't know if if it would block pollen sufficiently i, I mean i guess a, an n95 would presumably. an n95 certainly yeah. would i i think even a even a just a cloth, cloth mask, mask yeah. will, will catch i mean maybe not Certainly not all of it, but yeah. a significant amount of pollen. Um, I do. I can't remember what the scenario was, but there was a point two months ago. Maybe, maybe it was less than that. Maybe it was pollen. Mm -hmm. There was some mm -hmm. case where I actually did have some problem. I had a mask with me and didn't think to put it on because I've now become yeah, so yeah. resentful of this stuff. No, but I mean the like the big leaf maples really went to town this year with the pollen. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, it might well help. Sure. Which, you know, unfortunately, it's all so damn politicized now. It's it's hard to remember that. Yeah. Right? Exactly as you say. Okay. Um, every Western country from Canada to the EU has drafted laws to keep Twitter censored. Do you think they'll kill him 
if that doesn't work. Um, uh, be, for reasons that we have discussed, the difference between a world in which Twitter successfully escapes the censorious impulse and Twitter fails to escape, the, there's a, all the difference in the world. I don't think we know what happens if it succeeds. We know what happens if it fails because we, we're living it already. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, who knows what lengths they might go to to prevent this because the point is it isn't just Twitter. Once you have Twitter as a free place, it will cause a race to the top. And if we can hope. No, it, it, it's inevitable. And the same thing is true for universities and the same thing is true for newspapers. And so we should just keep your eye on anything where somebody threatens to put one of whatever it is together that mm -hmm. invades the problem mm -hmm. and expect fireworks. Okay, uh, two more questions. There are a few more than that, but we're going to get to two more here. Uh, an account called Storm for Congress on Twitter claims that, I think this is how I'm going to read this question here. I, I think that's what the framing of this question means. Uh, that the DOD is retesting and reviewing all service members for HIV and sickle cell. Could this be connected to the vaccine mandates? Uh, also, I would like your thoughts on the DOD covering up DMED data. I don't know any. I don't know what DMED is. I you think I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, basically, because the military is the military, it keeps better data. Mm -hmm. then but what's dmed i just don't know what that stands i don't remember what it stands for okay but i think what this is referring to is there's basically a database that's like you know the equivalent of VARES, but for military mm -hmm. personnel mm -hmm. and so the point is hey they vaccinated a whole heck of a large fraction of the military and they have pretty good evidence on what happened because mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know if you weren't discharged you're still being tracked by that system yep um, so I don't, you know, I don't know how they get out of that, but on the other hand, the military is downstream of the same capture corruption force that has gotten everything else. So mm -hmm. I'm not expecting that data to emerge and suddenly us all to become clear headed about what's going on. I'm expecting something gets in the road. Uh, what, what about the first part of the question? Um, According to an account on Twitter, the DOD is retesting or reviewing all service members for HIV and sickle cell. Could this be connected to the vaccine mandates? Um, well, there's, there, I don't know what sickle. I haven't heard a sickle cell connection. I, I, I don't, well, let's I don't, put it this way. Doesn't make any sense to me. But it cannot be sickle cell. I mean, sickle cell is entirely genetically heritable, mm -hmm. right? It's not. It's not vectored. It's but not contagious. Th this is why I'm wondering about the phraseology of the question. Yeah, you've got HIV which obviously can't come from COVID or a vaccine. Well, but, yeah, there's... But you could have immunodeficiency, which we know does, okay? Mm -hmm. In other words, immunodeficiency is a syndrome. It's not a pathogen. And it can be driven by a lot of things that disrupt a cascade. Mm -hmm. Likewise, sickle cell... The symptomology of sickle cell right, anemia. Right, you, you could have yeah. sickle You have or you cells. don't. You are or you're not heterogeneous for sickle cell. Or, or heterogeneous, heterocycus <laughs> for sickle cell. Um, but maybe it's controlled and then now it's not. Right. Yeah. Or, yeah. or you could imagine a disruption of hemoglobin formation that would cause a sickle cell-like phenomenon in people who genetically weren't uh, heterozygous. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I ain't saying that happened, but I would at least want to know if we're really talking about them yeah. testing for sickle cell, the genetic condition, are they checking genes? And presumably anyone in the military is already known whether or not they're, I mean, cause it, cause it, cause it manifests like you're not, you, not if you're heterozygous at all. Well, that's the thing is you have heterozygote advantage, so it doesn't manifest in a way that would necessarily show up. Well, I mean, you, you could, as far as I remember, and this is such like, it's such a simplistic example that it's used everywhere uh, where you learn first genetics. And I, I, I've always wondered if it's not more complicated than that but the heterozygote advantage for sickle cell is supposed to be about resistance to malaria yep. but i thought that there was also maybe only sometimes maybe not ever maybe i'm just wrong about this um some low level of sickling um in your cells well, if you're heterozygous for sickle cell yeah the way uh the way we 
teach it, whether or not it's accurate. And, yeah. You know, it makes sense with the right. cartoon in the damn textbook, whether right. the cartoon in the damn textbook is informative or not. But um, the idea is it is the reduced capacity of a heterozygote to carry oxygen that makes the blood inhospitable to malaria. That's right. So the blood does look different. So the blood cells are are slightly sickled. There's something. Right. Or half of them are or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Final question. If the November elections led to a Republican congressional supermajority, that is veto-proof, coming in January 2023, what do you think the wogigarchy, wogigarchy, no, wokigarchy, that's the better. Wokigarchy. Wokigarchy. I, yeah. I transposed, sorry, I, I, you, you did it exactly right here, uh, transposed the consonants. I'm going to start over. If the November elections led to a Republican congressional supermajority, that is veto-proof, like 61 or more, right? 60 is not veto-proof, but 61 would be veto-proof. I think so. Uh, coming in January 2023, what do you think the wokigarchy would do? Love you guys. Well, this, I hate to say it. I don't want to be that guy, but <laughs> um, A, the fact that this is a question might mean that it's not a question because the point is uh, the powers that be do stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you remember how we got Joe Biden? Nobody was going to vote for Joe Biden. How did we get yeah. Joe Biden? Well, Facebook helped. Yeah, I mean, something helped. Well, we know Facebook helped. And presumably, is it, are we certain that we know all of the things that helped? No, we don't. We don't know all the no, things. But I'm certain. just saying, look, yeah. we got a basic thing that we know, right? Uh -huh. We know the Democratic Party doesn't like primaries that actually function like primaries because you could get a really dangerous person like Andrew Yang oh, or Tulsi Gabbard. Oof. Imagine yeah. President Gabbard. It's terrible. terrifying. Doesn't speak for those Dems, no, no sir. it's terrifying nope. because she is one of those, what do you call them? Free thinkers. Patriot. That's mm, it, right? Both. Now yep. imagine mm -hmm. that you had a patriot in the office of the presidency. I mean, it's almost unthinkable. I can't remember a time. Right. It's, uh, it's, no, I think Obama was. I thought he was. Um, well, I don't know what happened with Obama. Yeah. I, he certainly sounded like one. Yeah. You know, the man could orate. But, um, but anyway... The point is, look, something in the Democratic Party rigs primaries. <gasps> what did he say? He said something in the Democratic Party rigs primaries. Yeah, you know what? When when uh, Bernie Sanders um, went to court over this, the Democratic Party did not argue that they hadn't rigged the primary. They argued it was their primary. They were entitled to rig it. <laughs> so I didn't make this up. Right? <laughs> I mean, you know. Well, that was just the legal defense. Of course, they could have argued that they hadn't done it. Sure. Come on, but, Brett. Well, give them right. a break. <laughs> why are you always so mean it. to them? I, <laughs> why am I always so mean to the Democratic Party and the Democratic National Committee? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Probably something wrong with me, I would guess. But, yes, I think so. Um, I mean, that's what they think. Right. When have they ever been wrong? <laughs> when have they ever been wrong? Right. Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, my point is a thing. With, with as much power as this thing has, you know, we never talked about. No, I don't. I think we should come back to it. The correspondence dinner. This year? This year? Mm -hmm. mm. It was quite something, and it really it was eye opening. I, I only have a slight glimmer that something. Ha I don't know. I don't really know what happened. Well, the president something. gave a speech. It was the president showed up. President showed up. He gave a speech. It was and bold of them to let him show up. It was risky. He did all right, though. I okay. mean, it was not. It wasn't a good performance, but in light of what could have happened, right? It was pretty impressive. Okay. Um, but it, it's all the stuff around it that was like jaw dropping and unbelievable. Anyway, we should come back to it another time. But suffice it to say, there's an awful lot of power. That power is not interested in playing fair. Elections are about playing fair. I don't know in what uh, I don't know about general elections, but I do know about primaries. They're they're rigged. They're openly rigged. Joe Biden swooped in because somebody needed something to regain control of a field in which, you know, you did have these very very dangerous people like uh, Andrew Yang and Tulsi Gabbard uh, so doing surprisingly well and foaming at the mouth patriots oh man mm -hmm. foaming at the mouth patriots so anyway no i don't trust that this could happen on the other hand 
you know, the thing, and I keep saying this, the thing that we do actually owe Donald Trump for is that he proved that it was possible to beat the establishment. He mm-hmm. succeeded in doing it, and it's unfortunate. Yeah, the Republicans didn't want him. They did not they want him. They didn't want him. And, you know, it is unfortunate that the character traits that oh, But made unfortunately, him... it may have proven that the Republicans are less good at controlling their own party than the Democrats are. I think that's true. Um, but anyway, my point would be, yeah. look, in order to do what Trump did, you needed to have character defects that meant that when he got there, he wasn't able to do what needed to be done. If you had handed, if you had handed Andrew Although Yang more, Donald Trump's cards, it would have been a very different thing. And it mm-hmm. didn't get to be a different sure. thing because, yep. unfortunately, the guy who was capable of beating the Republicans wasn't capable of recognizing um, the opportunity. Uh, and also, of course... The powers that be wanted to make sure that he couldn't wield that power. and No, we couldn't see the, the good that he did, and he wouldn't be allowed to do any more good than they could keep him from doing. And We weren't going to get an honest record of what he did and didn't no, accomplish, and he wasn't going to recognize what to do with the cards necessarily. But anyway, now we've gotten ourselves in enough trouble with enough people, <laughs> we can sign off. Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, praising Obama and Trump in the same little riff, that's deadly. <laughs> I don't think I praised either of them. Um, oh, no. I said he was a good order. Yeah, Obama's a good order. Yeah, no, in both yeah. cases. Anyway, uh, it, was, it was me more than you who did any praising. I mean, it wasn't high praise. It was low praise. It was praise. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, I think, are done. We're done. <laughs> we are finished <laughs> signing off. This was Dark Horse. This... <laughs> we'll see you somewhere yep. at some point. No, that's not it. That is not it at all. We will be back, but it's going to be a little while. But do stay tuned for uh, one or more guest episodes that Brett will have uh, be hosting with guests in the meantime. But we will be back, the two of us, for our next live stream on Thursday, May 26th, immediately followed by one on Saturday, May 28th. So uh, so hang on to your hats at that point. But until then, enjoy most of May. I hope it's gorgeous for you. And um, I don't know, relatively harmless, like Earth was sometimes uh, referred to as in the Douglas Adams Mostly trilogy. Harmless. Oh, I said relatively. Yeah, not relatively. Yeah. Um, that in the first edition of the Hitchhiker's Guide, I understand it was harmless. And then after Ford Prefect came and assessed, he got the adjective added, mostly. Mostly, yep. mostly harmless. Uh, well, may we, uh, may we do better than that. Yes. <laughs> may we do better than that. Uh, we will see you next time. In the meantime, be good to the ones you love, eat good food, and get outside. And wear a life preserver.